Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Words matter. They carry even more weight when they come from the Premier of British Columbia. British Columbians today expect answers from a Premier that has managed to avoid answering for his failure to protect the most vulnerable British Columbians. In July, the official opposition called for an independent review of the province's response to the heat wave that killed almost 600 British Columbians. This week, Human Rights Watch also called on this government, and I quote, to urgently investigate the full scope of the heat dome's impact, particularly on those most at risk. Without adequately understanding the scale of needs, the government will not be able to respond effectively to populations at risk." End quote. And it was to those very populations who were at risk that the Premier callously dis dismissed when he said, and I quote, fatalities are a part of life and there's a level of personal responsibility. Will the Premier today finally acknowledge that his comments were completely unacceptable and commit to a full and independent review as called for just this week by Human Rights Watch. Premier. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for her question. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, member for Fraser Nicola for her powerful statements uh, to start us off on question period today to remind us of the, the human cost of climate change, of poverty, of inequality. Issues that didn't appear yesterday, didn't appear a week ago, didn't appear months ago, but have been with us for a long, long time. We have special moments like those that have been brought to us graphically by the member for Fraser Nicola, very rarely, once in a thousand years with respect to the heat dome, once in a thousand years. But we all, and certainly we as a government and me personally as the Premier have a responsibility to make sure that we put in place processes, procedures, policies to ensure that we're better prepared for events like this because it will happen again. We have seen in the short time that I've had the privilege of being Premier, for three of the worst fire seasons in our history. We had a, a heat dome that had 50 degree temperatures in Lytton. The moment in minutes that town disappeared. So I agree very much with the Leader of the Opposition that words do matter. And if I offended anyone by talking at that time when we were just learning about the magnitude of what this summer would be, we were at that very moment at that press conference talking about lifting lifting restrictions on people as a result of a global pandemic. It wasn't a good day. It was not a good day for Lytton, absolutely not, or the two lives that were lost, or the hundreds of people who are still out of their homes. But we need to reflect on that, and we need to make sure we're better prepared. We have been taking steps. The, uh, the health minister has been working with respect to uh, better preparing our ambulance service, which again, did not lose its emphasis in four years or eight years or 10 years, but over a long period of time. With respect to a review of events this past summer, the coroner and the public health office are doing just that. I have full confidence in both of those individuals that they will be able to bring to this house and to the people of British Columbia answers to what happened, how it happened, and best of all, recommendations for solutions going forward. Leader of the official opposition, supplemental. Well, thank you very much, and the Premier has described those moments as special moments in British Columbia. But those are the moments when Premiers of this province need to rise and show leadership. The Premier was forced to admit that he was giddy about the ability to lift COVID restrictions. Giddy. 570 British Columbians lost their lives, and to suggest that it, was, it just happened, the Premier knows that is not true. The Premier commissioned a report that provided him with specific information that said it was going to happen and even predicted that hundreds of British Columbians could lose their lives. And this government did nothing. They were not prepared. And as a result, hundreds of families lost cherished loved ones. We've shared some of the stories this past week of those 
British Columbians. Howard Kalpas, who lost his three neighbors. 74-year-old Roberta Bunny Lalonde, who died alone in her condo. 69-year-old Ember, whose disability made her three times more likely to die from the heat. And Assistant Fire Chief Brian Bertuzzi, who valiantly tried to save the life of a British Columbian who died in the driveway of a fire hall in our British Columbia. 570 British Columbians died, and they deserve accountability from this Premier and a comprehensive independent review. I understand the role of the coroner in British Columbia. We want to ensure, as does Human Rights Watch, that all of the aspects of what happened are considered. British Columbians deserve that. So will the Premier today finally acknowledge that his government had been warned, that they paid no attention, and ultimately, British Columbians lost their lives as a result of the indifference? Premier. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, and no words that any of us say today can replace the loved ones that were lost this past summer. No words that we say in this place can replace those who have lost their lives as a result of an opioid crisis that is in its sixth year. No words that we can say can bring people back and make families whole again. But actions that we do take can make sure that those lives weren't lost in vain. And that is precisely what we intend to do. We have, for the first time, a minister responsible for climate change, the root, the root of the heat dome. We have a minister responsible for poverty reduction, the first time ever in British Columbia. The only part of the health ministry that went up more than mental health and addictions was the ambulance service because it had been ignored for far too long, Honourable Speaker. So I appreciate on a day, a solemn day, quite frankly, uh, that these questions have to come. And I, I respect the minister for the member for bringing them forward. I have full confidence in the coroner. I have full confidence in the public health office. Any resources they need to fulfill their job, they will have. Any access to anyone in this place, they will have. I believe that's what the people of British Columbia expect, and that's exactly what they're going to get. Member for Fraser Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the Premier was being giddy and ignoring the heat wave, it wasn't the only tragedy occurring. On June 30th, fire swept through the village of Lytton, destroying the entire community. The Premier said the right things at the time, and I quote, in terms of rebuilding throughout the system, that's our job. But as is the Premier's practice, the follow-up has failed to match the rhetoric. Denise O'Connor, a resident of the village of Lytton, has heard the words, but she wants action, so she sent a petition 30 days after the fire. Today, 99 days later, she's still waiting for the Premier to explain the plan for interim housing. Can the Premier explain to Denise why he's failed on such a basic commitment as interim housing for our Lytton residents? Premier. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for her question. And also uh, to Denise and other residents uh, who are still out of their community because it is uh, a dangerous place to be. There are still toxins uh, on the ground. The member is fully, fully aware of that. She made reference to uh, her and I uh, flying over uh, days after the event. Uh, we have been working as collaboratively, I hope, as possible. And I certainly stand uh, ready to work uh, more closely with the member if that's required. Uh, with respect to actions that we have taken, we have been working with the private sector. We've been working with the Fraser Basin Management Council uh, to assist in collaborating and bringing together the needs of um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike in the Lytton area. We established, uh, and again, these are, these are process uh, pieces, but critically important to getting outcomes. We created a, a working group of cabinet, of which I chair, that has the appropriate ministers responsible for housing, the minister responsible for emergency preparedness, the minister responsible for forestry, as well as the, uh, the parliamentary secretary for emergency preparedness, and most importantly, in my mind, 
The member for Boundary Similkameen, who at the time of the flood in 2017-18 in Grand Forks, was a local government representative. He too is on the committee to better help us understand the needs on the ground locally, coming from his perspectives and understandings and learnings from the tragedies that took place in Grand Forks. We are doing our level best to bring together the right people to make sure we can get people back into the community as quickly as possible. And we will rebuild a storied community with a future looking forward to deal with climate change, to make sure the buildings are adaptable for a future that will be very much like recent past. And, and again, I, I appreciate the member for Kamloops needs to pop off as well, but I speak directly to the I speak I speak directly to the member. I speak directly Members. to the member from Fraser Nicola. I stand ready to Members. work with her in the community to make sure we can rebuild as quickly as possible. But the cha the challenges faced in this area, she knows full well, and we are at her side, at the side of the members in that committee, to make sure we can get back as fast as possible. But it does take time to make sure the process, to make sure the cleanup is done appropriately, to support the municipal leaders who are struggling as well. The work's underway. I know the member knows that, and I'm certain the member for Kamloops South knows that as well. Member for Fraser Nicola Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One week in, I was pleased to join the Premier on a flyover of the village of Lytton. I expected that he would actually uh, follow his words and his promises to the people. I can tell you that if there are people on the ground doing the work, the residents aren't aware. And that is a tragedy. If you're doing your level best, my God, we're in trouble. Ninety-nine days, four letters to the government, endless emails, endless requests, and the people of Lytton have no idea what you're doing in their community. I would suggest this is much more than a communication problem. I have asked to, uh, for a team. I have said we need capacity in the community, and you have the expertise. To the chair member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But we're in trouble. And can the Premier tell the people of Lytton when they'll be given a detailed timeline and what is included in that timeline? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, the question from the member, and I want to inform her that there is significant activity taking place on the ground in Lytton. In terms of capacity, which, he is, uh, which, we, which she has uh, raised, uh, I can inform her that the province is has been funding the Fraser Basic Council to work with the, uh, the council in terms of the development Members, in, question was asked, and the minister is going to give an answer. Please listen to him. In terms of developing that recovery plan, that plan is due on the 15th of October, and once we receive it, I'm happy to share it with that member. In the meantime, the Minister of Municipal Affairs has ensured that there's capacity within the city itself to help deal with the, uh, the situation in, the, in terms of establishing services and re-establishing their capacity to function as a village. Uh, about nine members have been, uh, have been uh, seconded there. Uh, at the same time, uh, we brought in a CAO from, uh, former CAO from Kamloops, or sorry, from Kelowna, again, to ensure that the, uh, the, the village has the supports it needs to be able to function. We've met with the federal government uh, to ensure that not just the village, but the First Nation is in place and that they are, they are able to have interim housing plans, uh, a site uh, for, for inter interim housing in place. Uh, the Red Cross has got the supports in terms of ensuring on a case-by-case -case basis that People, please continue. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. As I said, on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that people have the accommodation and the supports that they need. Uh, as the member would know, uh, emergency social service supports are normally there for three days. They have been extended uh, till the end of November, and most likely, depending on how things go, will be extended further. The member, uh, the people know. Honourable Speaker, that there is a short-term, a medium-term and a long-term requirement in terms of building back Lytton. That is going to take place. As the 
Members, thank you. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Um, you know, the members asked a serious question. They wanted to know what supports are available. I've been detailing what the supports are available. The activities are taking on the ground. Uh, they seem more in interested in interrupting than they do in getting an answer to their question. Member for Sandwich, sorry, Sandwich North and Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's been over 1,100 arrests that have been made at the Ferry Creek Old Glo Growth Logging Blockades. It's the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history, spurred by this government's failed leadership to protect old growth forests. The videos of the conduct of the RCMP, our contracted provincial police force, are difficult to watch as they cause physical and emotional trauma. As the tension grew and the violence increased, all we got was silence from this BC NDP government. BC Supreme Court Justice Douglas Thompson found the RCMP's use of exclusion zones that limited media access to be illegal, calling the actions of the RCMP regrettable and damaging to our court's reputation. He criticized the RCMP decision to remove their identification and the lack of enforcement of a directive to remove badges displaying the thin blue line. All summer, the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, the minister responsible for policing in this province, has been silent. My question, through your Honourable Speaker, is to the Minister of Public Safety and the Solicitor General. What specific action has the minister taken to protect the civil liberties of the protesters? Minister of Public Safety. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Member, and I uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, I'd remind the, uh, the member that, that, uh, that the issue he's referring to is currently before the courts under appeal, and therefore I've got no further comment in that regard. Member for Sandwich and Island, Islands, supplemental. Uh, well, that's uh, what I'm asking about is police accountability. That's not before the court. That's the responsibility of every member in this chamber. Police accountability is our responsibility, and we bestow that responsibility on the Minister of Public Safety. It is completely unacceptable for him to stand in this House today and deflect that, saying that a matter of an injunction is before the court. What I'm talking about is that protecting the civil liberties of British Columbians. Justice Thompson refused to extend that injunction because of the unacceptable behaviour of the RCMP. That matter was decided. As Paul Wilcox summarized in the TIE, Justice Thompson, quote, found the RCMP's enforcement trampled on civil rights, went far beyond the terms of the injunction, unreasonably hid the actions from journalists' scrutiny, and failed basic tests of accountability, end quote. The minister has failed to make clear to the public and the RCMP throughout this summer his expectations of this government. He failed to demand access for the media, failed to demand officers wear proper identification, and failed to protect citizens in this province. We live in a democratic society, not a police state. We must ensure it never deteriorates to that. By demanding accountability in this place, not the House of Commons, here. As Wilcox wrote, and I agree, if the provincial government refuses to provide oversight, there is no meaningful accountability, Mr. Speaker. Our provincially contracted police service is the responsibility of the Minister of Public Safety. Through your Honourable Speaker to the Minister, will he stand in this chamber today and state publicly his expectation that all police services in this province uphold the law as outlined by Justice Thompson in both his decisions? Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, and again, uh, as he refers to uh, the decisions that are under appeal, I have no comment on, on that and cannot comment at this point. But in a more general um, um, situation, what I would say is that the Solicitor General in this province does not direct the police, and nor do we ever want politicians telling police what they should and should not do, Honourable Speaker. If there, is, uh, if there are issues and there are complaints, there are proces processes that are well established by legislation where people are able to make complaints against the police and they are investigated by independent bodies, honourable 
Honourable Speaker. Those are in place. I am aware that complaints were made. I am also aware that those complaints are being looked into and investigated, which is exactly what should happen, Honourable Speaker. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when the White Rock Lake fire uh, jumped Highway 97 and w ripped through Monty Lake and Paxton Valley uh, back in, in early August, these communities were absolutely devastated. 32 families lost their homes. They lost everything. In the midst of this year's fire season, the Premier said, and I quote, we're prepared to do whatever we can, end quote. But, Mr. Speaker, frustration is boiling over with these residents as they continue to wait and wait and wait for the supports that they were promised. Adding insult to injury, the Premier refused to visit Monty Lake and Paxton Valley. All that these residents got from their Premier was a quick flyover. He was in nearby Vernon, but he couldn't make the time to stop in Monty Lake and Paxton Valley. All the while, the Premier did have the time to take a vacation in the middle of the, the hardest part of the, the wildfire season in the southern interior. The Solicitor General, he hasn't had the guts to go to these communities either. Instead, he's lectured them, he's insulted them, and he's blamed them. These honest, hardworking, decent people, they need help from their government, not blame. Mr. Speaker, Monty Lake uh, resident Jacqueline G said, and I quote, our community was devastated by this fire. Homes have been lost, livestock too. It's been surreal. We feel like we've been left completely alone and frankly, just shunned as a community. I'm frankly shocked and disappointed that there is zero help for those who have lost everything, end quote. Rob Bouchard and his young family lost everything in Paxton Valley. He too feels abandoned and angry that his community has been blamed rather than supported. He said, and I quote, it's insulting to be portrayed as the bad guys here. We're all waiting for the Premier or the Solicitor General to come and talk to us in person, end quote. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is this. What, what does the Premier have to say to Jacqueline G and Rob Bouchard and the many other impacted residents of Monty Lake and Paxton Valley who need this Premier to get on with providing the supports that he has promised them? so that they can get on with rebuilding their homes and rebuilding their lives. Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable uh, Speaker, and I uh, appreciate uh, the, the question. Um, in terms of the supports that are available, uh, the, we are working very closely with the Thompson Regional uh, uh, District to ensure that uh, support services are in place, uh, working to determine the number of properties that are insured uh, and uh, those that are uninsured. Uh, recovery managers are in place to ensure that, uh, that those supports are, are, are in fact in place. The community has not been abandoned. In terms of disaster financial assistance, uh, that's already there. Uh, we work with the, uh, the federal government to identify what infrastructure qualifies. That's, uh, that work is underway so that we are able to go back and to rebuild communities that have been devastated by the, uh, the, the significant fires that occurred this summer. We, are, we have been working and we will continue to work to ensure that that takes place. Member for Kelowna West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the fires that ravaged my constituency may be out, but the damage is still being felt today. The White Rock Lake fire caused the loss of numerous homes and businesses, a total of 84 structures and one other home lost in the Mount Law fire. People had to scramble to safety, carrying the few possessions and find themselves displaced across the interior. Neil Morgan, and his sons lost two homes, a thriving business on Bolo Lake Road. Neil is a pensioner who has had to use his entire life savings to buy a used mobile home and rebuild his workshop. Hundreds of residents in Kalani Beach continue to be without potable water due to the speed that the wildfire ravaged their community, burning homes and not having proper shutoffs. My constituents are frustrated by the lack of clear communication from government as to what services are available and how to access them. I'm sure the minister would agree that the government should not be adding stress to those dealing with such catastrophic losses. So can the Premier tell Neil, his family, the Kalini Beach residents, 
and my constituents. What support is now available to constituents who lost their primary residence and do not have insurance or disaster financial assurance or assistance to the people that are on the community water system at Kalani Beach? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate the question. As I've outlined in terms of whenever disaster occurs, as the member knows, uh, fire is an insurable, uh, is considered an insurable event. Uh, there are exceptions to that in terms of the supports that are available. If there is a, uh, a, a municipal or a, a rural fire department agency or fire insurance is not available or it's too cost prohibitive. What I can tell you is that in terms of the supports that are available, uh, there are recovery uh, uh, individuals on the ground who are able to assist. We're working closely with the Red Cross uh, to ensure that if people have lost their primary residence, that there is places for them to stay, uh, that the supports are there, and they will be there for well into the future until they're needed. So all of that is taking place. Uh, and we will continue to stand with the community, again, in terms of disaster financial assistance. Uh, we work closely with the federal government in terms of what's eligible. There are a number of programs, depending on the kind of structure that was impacted, whether it's an agricultural uh, uh, building, agricultural structure, or whether it is a civic infrastructure such as water, or such as a police station, or such as a hospital. All of those things. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. It really is fascinating that when you're outlining the, the, the response to a question, you get the, the heckling from the other side. The reality is, is there's lots in place, and we are willing and ready to assist those people in accessing those supports. Member for Caribou, Chill Corton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Cunninghams have had a tough summer, to say the least, this year. Fires have ravaged their land, threatened cattle, and it has cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars in losses. To survive, they need to get their cattle back on the range, but can't do it without the replacement of crown fencing through disaster financial assistance, which must be secured by the province. Kevin Boone of the BC Cattlemen's Association says, and I quote, the Federal Disaster Assistance Program, which covers Crown resources such as Crown fencing, has not yet been approved. That is really big, an important one, as it will determine our ability to get the cattle on the range." End quote. Winter is coming, and if the Premier doesn't act immediately, ranchers like the Cunninghams will lose another full year of grazing. When will the Premier fight for the ranchers of this province and families like the Cunninghams to ensure that they get the supports they need right now. Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. This has been a really difficult summer for the ranching uh, industry, and we feel very grateful that we have had constant contact with Kevin Boone uh, and the BC Cattlemen's Association. We've had. Uh, constant contact with ranchers, and we're very aware of what's needed. We have secured a $20 million agri-stability fund that they can access to try and help financially recover what they've lost, but we know that what they've lost is greater than financial loss. The issue with the Crown fences is something that I believe my ministry spoke with Kevin about uh, late uh, yesterday afternoon, and those are conversations that will continue. But I can tell the member that my ministry and our government has been responsive to the cattlemen and the ranchers of BC. Um, we, we had issues uh, throughout the summer that we were constantly updated on and we were able to respond as necessary. Uh, it's a complicated situation, but we do understand that cattle need to stay in place and the issue of of um, putting fences up on Crown land is something that is a priority. House Leader of the Future Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's been a, an interesting week of dodging and avoiding personal responsibility on behalf of the Premier's actions. There's no accountability on questions around the opioid deaths and ever-increasing numbers of overdoses. Confusion around naloxone kits and direction from the CDC, the Solicitor General, both completely contradicting what the Premier had said about lack of naloxone supply. Heat dome, zero accountability on that. Three days worth of questions, zero accountability on that. About a report that they commissioned, the government commissioned themselves and ignored, Mr. Speaker, and then they ignore the questions. 
with any type of proper answer. A patchwork approach to schools, complete confusion and anxiety for teachers, support staff, parents, and most importantly, students. A lack of data transparency, a lack of timely information being shared within the school system, and yet no accountability from this Premier. And then today, wildfires. Even more lack of accountability from this Premier. And why is that concerning, Mr. Speaker? I think it sums it up best with the media advisory for the Premier's media veil today. The Premier, yet again, to dodge accountability and talking to the media, says, and I quote, in line with the BC Centre for Disease Control's physical distancing guidelines, media must call in rather than attend in person. Really? Mr. Speaker, the Premier doesn't even want to meet with the media in person, yet Dr. Henry has done that in this building this week. The Education Minister has done that in this building this week. The Solicitor General sat across from a radio host this morning in this building, and the Premier has no problem sitting elbow to elbow to elbow. Thank you. So, to the Premier. Once again, are you misspeaking and causing more confusion, or are you getting to operate under a completely different set of community guidelines for the Centre of Disease Control that the rest of the province doesn't seem to operate or work under? Premier. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I now uh, have even more heartfelt my thanks to Leanne at the start of question period today. But I, I will say that uh, I will uh, be accountable for a media advisory that I was unaware of, uh, of all of the issues that we could talk about. I'm grateful that the member brought it to my attention, and I'll take immediate action when I leave this place. Members. The bell ends the question period.